Well, thank you very much. And thank you very much for the uh, invitation. And thank you very much for the nice introduction also in, uh, in English. <laughs> I have to warn you already that uh, here from the start, I've been to Helsinki for l less than 24 hours, and I seem to have caught a quite severe flu. Uh, maybe I brought it from Copenhagen, I don't know. But you know, it means that I might be coughing my way a little bit through this, uh, this presentation. But I hope we'll, uh, we'll manage somehow. Nevertheless, um, yes, I won't say that much more about uh, myself. I might say that I'm not a, a health or medical professional. I'm a sociologist, uh, and that sort of speaks into the fact that I can understand that, uh, that we are a quite mixed crowd here today. And I think that's a really good thing. Uh, one of the things that I will say today, one of my points is that um, uh, that support of, of refugees with trauma uh, entails a wide range of different measures and different interventions and different activities. Also some modes of support that lie beyond the scope of specialized treatment. So I think that one of my main points today, if you can be boiled down to, to the fact that you are all important in this work, uh, regardless of which sector that you, you are working in. Um, I'll say a little bit about the, our integration department. I'm from the Knowledge Center for Vulnerable Refugees, that was, as it was just said, uh, which is the knowledge center that we have in the integration department. We do basically what knowledge centers do, <laughs> meaning that we collect uh, and disseminate knowledge and skills. So we primarily deal with professionals that uh, work with refugees in their daily work, that meet refugees, uh, social workers, health professionals, teachers, uh, pedagogues, etc. Uh, and we, we provide materials, we do training, uh, education, and we have a counseling service. So that's basically what we do. Then we have some colleagues uh, in, the, in, the, in the department, other sections. Uh, Lerdansk means learn Danish, if you translate it. Uh, we run uh, quite a few language schools, Danish language schools in Denmark, both for refugees and other types of migrants, of course. Then we have Integration Net, which would be uh, relevant in this context, uh, which is the section that provides professional integration services uh, for the municipalities in Denmark, um, ranging from uh, employment programs to family therapy, uh, rehabilitation, um, and stuff like that. Uh, and even though I don't understand much of the program today because it's in Finnish, I see that there is also a, a, a presentation coming up focusing on, on narrative exposure therapy. That's also one of the methods that, uh, that uh, Integration Net works uh, extensively with. Yeah. We also organize the volunteer department, organize a, a significant part of the volunteer uh, work with, uh, with the reception and integration of refugees. We organize and support around 8,500 volunteers uh, nationwide. Yeah. All right, let's see. I'll talk more or less uh, about this uh, now, uh, the key points of my pre presentation. First, I'd like to say a bit about uh, the, the background of refugees coming to Denmark, coming to Finland, uh, coming to, to Europe. Uh, it's not all refugees that are traumatized or are suffering from PTSD, but it would be fair to assume that all refugees that arrive uh, here are fundamentally shocked by the turn their life have, have, have uh, taken. I'll say a bit about that, the background for that. Also, we have to understand that um, the background of the refugees with war and uh, persecution, flight and vi violence, that's not the only reason uh, that the new life in exile is difficult. The, the conditions and the terms that they offered here in Finland or in other countries, in Denmark for example, are also of great importance. And I'll say a bit about, uh, about that. Um, and then uh, there will also be uh, a group of uh, the refugees coming here that are affected in a way that will minimize their resources and their, cap and their capacities, etc. 
and I'll say uh, something about their symptoms and something about their needs. And then uh, a key point uh, is also that one of the primary needs of refugees, uh, regardless uh, of whether they're traumatized or not, will be having uh, a normal everyday life with meaningful activities as everyone else, such as uh, participating in school, attending language classes, having a job, whatever it might be. Hmm? Yes. And we all know it. Uh, we face a global challenge now, today, with more than 65 million people. Uh, uh, 65 million refugees are internally displaced in the world. That's the number that is estimated by the UNHCR. And this, of course, affects all the countries that are uh, affected by war and conflict, and it affects their neighboring countries, but it also affects Europe, affects Denmark, affects Finland, and is basically the reason why we are, are gathered here um, today. One of the major conflicts that we see at the moment, as we also know, all of us, is of course the conflict in, in Syria with the civil war that has been going on since 2011. We can see that the infrastructure has has collapsed in Syria, as this picture here uh, shows. There's, just, there's not much of a healthcare system left in Syria. There's only temporary help for victims of war, uh, and there's almost no normal healthcare available for sudden illnesses or, or, or chronic uh, conditions uh, left in the country. And for many of the refugees, I think this image is a pretty good picture of, uh, of the turn their life has taken. You've probably seen these images before, these before and after pictures from Syria, right? And it, of course, is indicative of what's happened in Syria and what refugees from Syria have, have experienced, but it's also quite indicative of the sort of mental condition, I think, of the refugees arriving here. Um, because most of the refugees that arrive here in Finland or in Denmark, they have, they have you know, had a perfectly normal uh, life with uh, job, schooling for the kids, dreams of the future, etc. And then all of a sudden, their life has turned into a chaos with insecurity, with violence, and with urgent needs to take uh, very quick and short-term decisions that are very important and not, knowing re not really knowing the consequences of these decisions. For most refugees, uh, there are no direct way from the conflict uh, or from their homes, from their home country to a permanent place of safety. Most of them will have been moving around, either inside their home country, for example Syria uh, at first, then going to a neighboring country where some of them have been staying for shorter or longer periods in, in refugee camps like this. Uh, this is from Jordan. Uh, but actually it's quite few of the refugees that arrive to Europe, arrive here, uh, that have been living in camps uh, like this. Uh, because most of the refugees that live in the neighboring countries, they live in, you know, whatever is possible. Abandoned buildings, rented rooms, temporary shelters, uh, like this one, uh, a refugee shelter in, uh, in Lebanon, where there are basically no uh, big uh, refugee camps as such. So that's some quite sort of insecure and temporary conditions that refugees have been facing for a shorter or longer period of time. As it is for all adults who, whose lives have been set on, uh, on standby, it'll be the same for refugees that live uh, temporarily in these refugee camps or in these refugee settings. They will soon lose their energy, uh, they will lose their initiative, uh, they will lose their da daily routines when they don't have the opportunities to, to support themselves and provide for their families. And therefore it's of, of, of quite big importance to facilitate some meaningful activities for adults, as for example this um, education in, in computer skills, or it could be supporting a small boutique uh, like this, the 7-Eleven of, of one of the camps, I guess you could say. And it's of course also of big importance to support the children. It goes for the children here, but also in other refugee settings. Uh, because they're of course without any influence uh, in their situation. And often their parents, they don't have the resources or abilities or energy or possibilities to give them uh, what they need. 
So because of that, the Danish Refugee Council and other organizations uh, also, of course, uh, establish um, spaces such as this, child-friendly spaces around in various refugee uh, settings so that the children can have a small break um, from their harsh daily life and, uh, and uh, a break from their parents as well, perhaps. Uh, and their parents can get some uh, relief um, also. We also, by, by this, try to give the children a bit of education so that their lack of schooling will not be too uh, severe later on. Yeah, we've also seen pictures like this, right? Um, some of the refugees, they have experienced more traumatizing ex situations or experiences during their flight than in their home country, perhaps, uh, by crossing the Mediterranean, such as this. Um, a Syrian refugee that I know, he, uh, he, he witnessed his, uh, his partner being killed in their home. He lived for a, a period of time under very insecure uh, conditions or circumstances in Egypt. And then he was picked up, rescued uh, somewhere in the middle of the Mediterranean between Libya and Italy. So just for saying that the traumatizing experiences do not only have to do with persecution or war in the home country, also the whole trip uh, or the journey also up through Europe uh, is, a, is a hard one. There are many modes of dangers or uh, exploitation that goes on uh, during, this, uh, during journeys like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now I'll say a bit about the conditions and terms for newcoming refugees living in exile. That's of course quite important uh, also. Uh, and I'll focus on the conditions in Denmark as the example. Uh, they might differ a little bit from the conditions that you have here, but I would assume that there will be quite some similarities also. A little bit about the numbers. Uh, we have seen a, an increasing number of asylum applicants coming to Denmark as you have also seen in, in Finland, and as has been the case uh, all over Europe. We saw a peak in, in 15, with a bit more than 21,000 uh, asylum applicants coming to Denmark, and then we see the decreasing number <coughs> in 2016. We've also seen quite a few unaccompanied minors coming to Denmark, uh, not least from Afghanistan, to an extent also from Iraq. And the, the number of uh, people given asylum and a residence permit corresponds basically uh, to these numbers, right? With the peak in 2015, with almost 11,000 uh, people getting asylum uh, in Denmark, and then uh, a slight decrease after that. Um, you see the numbers of 16, the number of residence permits are higher than the number of asylum applicants, and that's of course because there's a bit of a delay uh, in the system. So people that come and apply for asylum in 15 might not get their residence permit until 16 or even 17. Uh, and the biggest group of nationals uh, have been the Syrians in Denmark. Uh, there's also been quite a few from Afghanistan, Eritrea, and the stateless category there is, of course, stateless uh, Palestinians that are basically fleeing from the same conflict or the war uh, in Syria. Yeah. <coughs> so, here's a list of some of the most influential factors that we know from research that affects refugees' possibilities for a good mental health and the quality of life. We have the ongoing existential uncertainty, uh, meaning the stress that you and your family faces when you don't know whether you can stay in the country of exile, whether you can stay in Denmark, stay in Finland, or whether you might have to leave again. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, depending on the duration uh, and the extension of your residence permit. It's an uncertainty that uh, refugees have experienced before they came to Denmark or Finland, but it might continue to have a role to play in their life, and then also in their mental health. I'll get back to that. We have the poor socioeconomic conditions, um, which is a reality for uh, most refugees in Europe also in Denmark, and I'll get back to that. Uh, loss of social status is a separate issue here that also affects the mental health of your refugees. 
We have the lack of social relations um, for all human beings. Uh, the lack of social relations can lead to uh, loneliness, to isolation, and to depression. And for most refugees, it can take years before they are able to build a social network uh, again, if they are ever able to, to do so. Then we have uh, a lack of, of connection to the established healthcare uh, system. It's crucial for refugees that might have experienced years without uh, normal health care to be able to connect well with the health care system in the country of, of exile. And it's crucial for them and their families that um, if some of the adults or the children, they have severe problems caused by trauma, PTSD, of course, that they uh, receive treatment as soon as possible. So there's a separate challenge there or in, in, in terms of of uh, identifying uh, trauma uh, as soon as possible and identifying the needs of treatment and, uh, and, and to act on that as soon as possible. And then, of course, refugees, they are affected by other factors, stress factors of life, as everybody else. Uh, you know, divorce, unemployment, chronic illnesses, uh, etc. And to, to uh, continue a bit, say a bit more about this issue of the ongoing existential uncertainty, uh, it's important to understand the different categories of stay uh, or the residence permits uh, that uh, refugees, they are offered or they are given. In Denmark, you can, there are three types of residence permits uh, in the Danish Aliens Act. The, the, the first one that you see on top here the convention status, that is granted to the refugees that live up to the requirements of the, of the UN Geneva Convention, meaning that they risk um, uh, individual persecution due to their uh, race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, if they are, for example, homosexuals or whatever, uh, or their political opinion. Then we have the, the protection status, which is given to refugees that might love, not live up to the requirements of the convention, but who nevertheless risk uh, being uh, exposed to torture or other kinds of inhumane or degrading treatment if they return. They are given what's called protection status. And then we have a quite new uh, regulation, a new status, it was uh, adopted in 2014, called the Temporary Protection Status, which is uh, targeting mainly those fleeing uh, countries with conflict or war, the Syrians, um, <coughs> for example. Um, and what is interesting here, uh, or worth noticing, is the, is the duration of the residence permits. That they last for one or two years, and then they have to be renewed uh, after that. So that means that refugees, they live uh, for shorter or longer periods of time with this insecurity or uncertainty. You know, can I have my, my residence permit renewed or can I not? What will happen? How do I do it? And that, of course, uh, requires a lot of sort of energy to focus on that. Uh, and it's stressful uh, in itself. And that's, of course, uh, we all know that stress is not a good thing if we are talking about uh, refugees that are uh, traumatized. What is particular uh, with the temporary residence permit uh, or the temporary protection status is that the refugees that are given that status in Denmark, they cannot apply for family reunification uh, before they have been in Denmark for three years. And that's, of course, um, a huge issue a huge negative issue for the ones that face that. Around a third of the refugees in Denmark, they are given that status. And recently, uh, the regulation has also been changed so that now refugees, they have to pay uh, for the plane tickets uh, themselves uh, when they are granted family reunification. Another stress factor, right? Yeah. And I said no one starts out in Denmark with a permanent permission. Uh, a permanent residence permit, I would assume it would be the same in Finland, right? Um, in Denmark, it is so that you can apply for a permanent residence permit after six years. We will probably see a change in the regulation in a few months uh, in the law, so it will be uh, prolonged till eight years. 
Uh, and as it is now, you can apply for citizenship after, after eight years. That will probably be nine years uh, with the upcoming uh, legal changes. Um, and there are, of course, some requirements also uh, uh, that you have to fulfill in order to get a permanent residence permit in terms of uh, employment. You have to pass a certain level of a Danish exam. Uh, you, have, you, you must not have been on uh, you know, um, uh, public benefits for a certain period of time. And that's, of course, requirements that is, that is very difficult for refugees, not least refugees with trauma, to uh, fulfill another stress factor. Um, refugees in Denmark, they're not free to choose in which municipality they want to live. We have this quota system um, where the refugees, they are dispersed to almost all the municipalities in Denmark. There's these yearly quotas that are being uh, decided, agreed upon based on how many refugees in total the Danish Immigration Service uh, estimates will come to Denmark for the next year. So the municipalities, they're given a certain quota, depending on the size of the, the municipality, depending on um, the number of uh, inhabitants with minority ethnic backgrounds already, and depending on the number of family reunifications they have received. Uh, and the thing is that the Refugees, they are expected to stay in the municipality they're referred to for as long as, as their integration program lasts. They can move, but if they move, they will lose some of the rights and benefits that are part of the integration program. So that means that, uh, as it is now, with the recent changes, the, the, the integration program has been uh, cut down, you can say, from three years to one year, but then uh, with the possibility to renew it up to five years, and that's what's most likely going to happen for many refugees. So, so, so a lot of the refugees that are receiving a residence permit in Denmark, they have to live where they are placed. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, and to say a little bit about the, the integration program. In Denmark, it's the municipalities or the local governments that are in charge of the integration of refugees. Uh, it's the state or the immigration service that are in charge of the asylum system. But once refugees they have been granted uh, a status, uh, they're referred to the municipalities. The municipalities, they have to provide uh, housing. Uh, they have to provide permanent housing, but in the beginning they can provide temporary housing, and our experience is this, that the temporary housing can last for quite a while. So it will probably be, uh, um, the refugees will be living in Denmark for quite a while before they are giving, uh, given a permanent place um, to stay. It's also so that uh, within the first month, the municipality, they have to formulate and sign an integration contract that contains the individual plan for Danish classes, work training, uh, and the refugees, they are entitled to a, um, an integration benefit. It's a benefit that was introduced in 15 for, um, yeah, mainly for refugees, right? Uh, and which is quite low. Um, so the uh, sort of economic conditions for newly arrived refugees is very, very, you know, tight. Um, it was previously so that uh, the municipalities, they had to offer uh, a health screening for all the newcoming re refugees. We thought it was a really good idea to have this compulsory health screening or, you know, the, the, the refugees, they didn't have to take it, uh, but, but the municipalities, they had to offer it. Uh, but it has been uh, removed. Uh, proved a bit costly perhaps, uh, municipalities would like to be freed of that obligation. So now uh, the municipalities, they don't have to, uh, they, they don't have to offer uh, this uh, health screening. Uh, they only have to offer it for uh, resettled quota refugees, but for the spontaneous refugees, they don't have to offer it now. Now it's the individual um, social worker that um, must assess in the specific situation with the, with the single refugee, whether he or she thinks there is a need for a health screening. And if the assessment is that there is a need, then they have to offer it. 
but the question is whether the social worker is able to do that assessment, right? Uh, and whether he or she has the time to do it. Um, it's also so that everyone is entitled to Danish education for five years. Um, and there's been an increasing focus in the last years, probably also here, on employment. I don't know. Uh, so now it is so that the Danish classes, they must not in any way stand in the way for, for employment-related uh, activities. Um, um, yeah, and the refugees are also enrolled in various sort of employment programs. Um, uh, they are typically sent out into short-term internships quite early in the integration process uh, in order to facilitate that, you know, people get a job and stuff like that. So, so refugees in Denmark, they are typically enrolled in this full-time program with two or, two or three days a week with Danish classes and two or three days a week with in internships uh, in private companies. Um, yeah, and as I said before, the integration program, they now run for one year with the possibility of extending it up to five years or basically extending it up to the point where people are, um, uh, you know, have a job, right? Yeah, and speaking of jobs, um, you can see here in the second table below that the employment for refugees is not high. It's actually quite low. Um, but after three years, uh, only 29% of uh, refugees, they have a job, and only 25% of the uh, spouses, reunified spouses, have a job. And to get a uh, just a, a, a little idea of the learning potential. Uh, you can see here in which level of Danish education the, the refugees, they are, they are placed when they arrive. Uh, that most, they are placed on the level two. Uh, and uh, quite a significant part is placed on level one, which is the lowest level for those uh, that are uh, illiterate or don't have, or, uh, or um, don't have any education. So that means that there are some you know, challenges uh, in terms of getting education, learning the language, getting uh, a job. And we also see significant differences between men and women. Yeah. All right. So now let's move on to, to the topic here, the group of people who are also affected by what they have been through in a way that affects their mental health their learning ability, their ability to build a new life in Denmark uh, or in Finland or whatever, wherever it might be. And it's of course not possible to set an exact number on how many uh, refugees suffer from trauma or PTSD. Uh, it's not possible to, to say that there is a certain, you know, uh, set part of, of, of the group. But, uh, but um, if you look at the research, I think we have Estimates that say that up to as many as half or 50 percent of the refugee population have, you know, some trauma, PTSD symptoms. And if we look at the international research, um, the target group of those fulfilling the, the PTSD diagnosis and hence having the need for specialized uh, treatment seems to be between 13 to 25 uh, percent. That's more or less what different studies uh, show internationally. And you can say that all, uh, all refugees, they, they start their new life in exile based on, uh, on a lot of losses. They have lost their home country, they have lost their culture, they have lost their familiarity with you know, where they are, they have lost their language. They uh, come to a new place where things, they work in different ways, new social codes. They have lost their family and their friends. They have lost all their belongings. They have lost their status, their sense of self, their plans for the future, uh, their identity, basically. They have lost their, the plans they've had, so they have to rebuild themselves almost entirely, and they have to do that in a new context that um, they don't know. That's of course in itself a quite stressful situation. <coughs> uh, 
And for those with, uh, with severe consequences of traumatic uh, experiences, uh, some of these uh, symptoms will be visible or worth noticing when, when dealing with, uh, with refugees with, with trauma. Um, first, we see that um, persons with PTSD will typically be in a state of constant alert, a high uh, arousal, meaning that refugees or other people with trauma or PTSD, they are, so to speak, allergic to stress. Um, a refugee from Syria that I know, he has, he has described it to me as if, he has, as, as if he's walking around with a volcano inside of him. Uh, this uh, unpredictable uh, rumbling, a lack of control, it might erupt uh, once in a while without him being able to, to control it. That means that uh, refugees with uh, trauma, PTSD, that they need a predictable, they need a quiet, and they need a structured every day without too many interruptions, without too many changes, or without too many surprises, basically. Refugees with trauma will uh, also often suffer from uh, various kinds of invasive thoughts and images. Um, it can be while they're asleep as uh, nightmares or while they're awake as, as different kinds of flashbacks. Um, and this, of course, affects, for example, their sleep. It would be fair to assume that if you know any uh, or meet any uh, refugees with trauma, they sleep very little. They sleep very badly. They might not sleep at all. Uh, and that, of course, in itself affects their resilience and their resources and their learning abilities. And those who, who suffer from these sorts of, of flashbacks, uh, it's, of course, quite natural to develop some sort of avoidance behavior. That if you experience flashbacks, you do whatever you can to, to, avoid, uh, to avoid having them. Um, that means that you uh, avoid certain certain thoughts or uh, emotions, uh, you avoid certain places, whatever uh, reminds you of what you don't want to be reminded of. And that means that refugees uh, with trauma, they, uh, they very often, you know, uh, put themselves in situations of social isolation. Uh, they might keep to themselves, be afraid to interact uh, with other people, going out, perhaps. And this, of course, has great impacts on their daily lives and, uh, and large consequences for the individual and for the family. Um, in Denmark, it is so that uh, refugees with trauma, they have the right to specialized treatment and it's free via the, the public health care uh, system. And we have rehabilitation centers in all the regions and in, in general it is so that the, that, the, that the traumatized refugee, they have to be referred to specialized treatment by the doctor, by the general uh, practitioner. Uh, it's also, I think, a fact that it's also a challenge for the municipalities to handle this group. It's their obligation, but it is also a, a challenge for them. There was a, a study that was conducted in 2013 uh, where um, a lot of the respondents from the municipalities and health professionals, they, they assessed that, uh, that the screening was unsatisfactory and, um, and that the measures, they were not comprehensive and they were not uh, coordinated. Um, but there are measures that have been taken to try to improve this a little bit. I said that the, that the, that the obligatory health screening is not there anymore, but there are other activities that try to um, that try to sort of uh, enhance the handling of this group. The Danish Agency for International Recruitment and Integration is, for example, cur currently um, uh, uh, doing this quite big uh, project where they are developing various tools for tracing and identifying uh, trauma. They are, um, they are developing a tool for tracing uh, uh, trauma that's targeting a wide range of professionals that meet uh, refugees on a daily basis, meaning you know it can be teachers, pedagogues, social workers, etc. 
uh, that are given some material with some um, information about what to look for, you know, what to worry about, uh, and given also a, a central contact point in the municipality. This, uh, these tools are being developed and tested in collaboration with some chosen municipalities at the moment. Um, it also implies a, uh, a model of collaboration uh, in these municipalities that are being tested. Apart from this tracing tool, there's also being developed a more specific identification tool for the social workers that actually has the, the, the dialogue uh, with, uh, with the refugees uh, so they can test whether or not there is a need for specialized treatment here. This tool is based on, I don't know if you know, it is called the Protect Questionnaire. It's an international tool that has been developed by, by some NGOs in various uh, European uh, countries. It's quite simple. It's a tool with sort of ten questions. Do you, how do you sleep? Uh, do you often feel anxiety? Stuff like that. And then depending on how many do you tick yes or no, you, you sort of uh, do this score uh, to inform uh, you on your decision of, of whether or not uh, further action is needed. Yeah. Um, as I said, what we do know from research is the importance of getting back to a normal, meaningful, everyday life for refugees, in particular for refugees with trauma. This also includes uh, having a job. There's quite a big emphasis on the issue of employment and getting a job, and also some reluctance, of course, in terms of, well, is that possible? Can people with trauma do that? Is it bad for them? Uh, but, um, for example, there's a Danish study from Dignity, the Danish Center Against Torture, where we see a positive correlation uh, between having a job and having a better psychological health, independently of the completed treatment. It's of course often not realistic with a normal full-time job for traumatized refugees, but the point of the study is that, um, as well as also some other studies, that a meaningful, well-structured everyday life is of great importance. And it's also basically also a way of healing for traumatized uh, refugees. Yeah, and it, this implies it doesn't only go for for jobs or employment, it implies that it's important to emphasize uh, on such things as, for example, kindergarten for the children, uh, going to school, uh, having a job and so on, because it's activities that can help create a sense of inclusion, uh, a sense of normality and a sense of meaning uh, of life for vulnerable refugees. And that means that teachers, social workers, pedagogues, etc., they also contribute to well-being, they contribute to healing, and in a way, you can say that they also contribute to treatment, even though they're not therapists, of course. And I think it's also important for the health sector and for uh, health and medical professionals to have that in mind also, that the activities that are being carried out in other sectors by other professionals around the traumatized refugees are very important. Um, there's this... Uh, uh, another refugee I know from Syria, he has been uh, rejected, or not rejected, but it was the assessment by his psychiatrist at the rehabilitation center that he would not be able to benefit from treatment before his social conditions improved, right? And I think that's sort of a, uh, also indicative of the fact that uh, other um, interventions, uh, other places, uh, other circumstances surrounding the individual is of great importance and also something that uh, supplements uh, uh, the, 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 sp the more specialized treatment. And that means that there are several uh, modes or levels um, of uh, intervention and support that also lie beyond or in some cases before specialized treatment uh, and therapy. And that means that the efforts of volunteers, of pedagogues, teachers, social workers, and so on. They have to do with level one and two here, right? Um, with supporting and restoring uh, protection and resilience. So 
So that's also basically what we do quite a bit in our knowledge center. We focus on on giving tools to to uh, to professionals that work uh, on these levels uh, here. Yeah. So to summarize the points a bit. Uh, we have to keep in mind the full picture of refugees living uh, in exile if we want to understand the traumatized refugee and if we want to provide the right help and the right support to this group. The everyday stress, the lack of concentration, etc. Uh, and the reasons why it's very difficult for some to handle the new challenges, they are multiple. They might deal with or have to do with trauma but, uh, but uh, you know, trauma related to war or persecution or conflict or violence, but they might also relate to you know, the new and for some quite um, alienating life in exile with shorter or longer periods of uh, insecurity. And then um, basically and quite simple, a lot of the stress, uh, a lot of the strain also relate to the simple fact that Practically all newcoming refugees live in small apartments with a very tight economy and, and very few possibilities to change that. So now I've dragged you through a, a set of regulations in Denmark, but I think there's a point to it. And the point is that it's important to, to be aware of and to address the whole circle here, or all the circles here, if we want to understand if you, and if you want to improve the conditions for refugees with trauma. Specialized treatment is one aspect, trauma is one aspect, but there are other types of stress that it's important to address or handle or help the refugees handle themselves. Um, in terms of some basic approaches and points of attention when trying to create this supportive environment elsewhere than uh, the treatment, it could be something like this. First, and basically acknowledge that such things as language education or going to school or going to work, if it's possible, that is important in itself and is beneficial to vulnerable and traumatized um, refugees. Because it's a possibility for inclusion, it's a possibility for social uh, community. And because this issue of inclusion is so important, it's of course also of great importance that we meet the vulnerable refugees and refugees in general as individuals and that we don't see them uh, as patients, that we don't see them only as people with a PTSD heading or headline, but that we meet them and see them as uh, individuals that also has resources, that have capacities, that have dreams, that can do stuff. Yeah. It can also be sort of a useful overall approach uh, in various sort of institutional settings that if you, you know, acknowledge that trauma implies internal chaos to uh, that you, through the daily activities, you try to contribute to creating some sort of uh, external structure around the, the, the refugees. Um, so this principle of, of external structure, it, it, it can be used to focus on creating a sense of security, uh, to create routines and create predictability. When we talk to, uh, to for example, teachers or, 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 or people working uh, in daycare or whatever, we are quite inspired by um, Lars Gustafsson. I don't know if you know him. He's a Swedish child psychiatrist. He has developed... Uh, some models for, for dealing with uh, traumatized refugees and that underline some of the same principles as here, to work with structure, to work with routines, uh, etc., to create a sense of security, to help organize the activities. Um, yes. At the same time, it's of course not easy to um, to deal with or work with uh, people with traumatic uh, experiences. Sometimes, for example, traumatized persons, they can make themselves more helpless perhaps than they are. Uh, and they can demand a lot of help and support uh, that uh, various people, depending on their role and profession, they cannot offer. And it's of course also important to remember that if you're not a therapist, you're not a therapist, right? 
if you're a teacher, you're a teacher. You have to do the teaching. But, uh, but it's important to know uh, who can you refer to. And it's also important to, to be able to, um, to talk to the refugees also about the difficult things. It's important that you do not over-identify with traumatized um, refugees, where you lose sight of your core task, for example. It's also important that you don't do the opposite, that you do not distance yourself from refugees with trauma because you think it's difficult, because you think it's sensitive, because you can't handle it. So it's important that you as a professional or as a volunteer try to find this good sort of position in between. We usually refer to it as a good empathetic standpoint. Mm -hmm. A standpoint that's sustainable both for you and also for the person that you're dealing with or working with. Yes? A last overall uh, point that's perhaps not a surprise, but, uh, but something that is also good for many refugees to uh, be made aware of. Uh, there was this uh, another uh, refugee that I know at some point he had on his Facebook this profile picture uh, just with the text, pain changes people. And I think that's sort of quite uh, indicative of what it feels like to uh, be a refugee, uh, what it feels like to have experienced traumatic experiences without really knowing, you know, what does that entail. That you, if you have experienced that, you all of a sudden become another person, a different person, a new person, you, rea you react in different ways, uh, you don't have the resources that you have been used to, you think you're going crazy because you don't really know what's happening. And in that sense, it's important for refugees also to be made aware that even though you are suffering from traumatic experiences, you might have PTSD, it's not because you are, um, you are crazy or not because you are strange. It's totally normal for uh, five minutes. It's totally normal for, uh, for, for people who have experienced uh, extreme things to react in this way. All right, um, I'll just finish off with a few uh, Websites here, they're in Danish. Uh, I'm sorry about that. I don't know if you, if you, uh, if any of you will be able to, to get much out of that. But it's just uh, also an example, just to say that what we have uh, in our organization or in our knowledge center, we of course also have a, um, a website uh, where all the materials that we produce they can be uh, found. We also send out a newsletter every other month with news about uh, activities, new knowledge, studies, whatever. Uh, about the work with uh, refugees with trauma. And together with uh, some re rehabilitation centers, we also run this uh, website called trauma.dk, which is a website with uh, various types of information about refugees with trauma. It's structured in a way so that you have, um, <coughs> you can enter it uh, depending on what kind of profession you have. So uh, we have material that is targeted health professionals, material targeting uh, social workers, material targeting uh, uh, pedagogues, people working with children, uh, etc. And we also have material uh, for refugees uh, themselves. For example, we have a, a video that we've made where um, five refugees, they tell about their own life, uh, they tell about how they have moved on with their life in exile, even though they have been affected with trauma. It's a movie that can be good to see as a professional, but that you can also see together with, um, with uh, traumatized refugees or give to them. Uh, it's, it's, it's translated with, uh, with speak and, and subtitles in various languages, so, so, um, so traumatized refugees can get an idea of what is going on with themselves and to get a, a sense of this. <coughs> yes, I think I made through it without too much of a cough. <laughs> so, yeah. Mm -hmm.
Yes, so many thanks, Matt. And um, I think that we saw that there are many similarities to the fin Finnish systems and then there are some, some differences. But now we are having a few minutes for, for, for questions. Okay, meanwhile people are warming up, I, I might yes. ask something. Yes. Um, um, <coughs> like if, if we would live for just a second in, in some kind of fairy tale world, and I would ask you that what, what would be, if, if you had like three wishes, now as, as you know that well the whole Danish system and everything, what, what would be your three wishes if, if you could you know, wish whatever you would like? to improve in, in, in the Danish system so that it would be, or it, it would make like uh, a difference uh, in, in, in regard to the <coughs> mental health of the refugees and yeah. asylum seekers. Um, I think um, one of the things that we see these years is that we see uh, a lot of uh, legal changes in the area of, uh, of integration. Uh, a lot of legislative, legislative changes, uh, which means that it is increasingly difficult, I think, for social workers and others to find out what to do, <laughs> what are their obligations, what are they not. So I think that that means that the refugees uh, at the moment um, get sort of confusing advice, perhaps. So some stability in the, in the rights and the obligations and the framework would be good. Then I think that in general, equal treatment, equal rights, equal benefits would be good in order to get a sense of uh, inclusion, uh, to uh, get some acknowledgement. Uh, and then I think that what we see, um, I don't know if that's the situation here also, we see some uh, new uh, measures, uh, new legislation making it increasingly difficult in some way for uh, for um, for refugees, we see lowered benefits, for example, we see increased requirements in order to get a permanent residence. Uh, so there are these sort of systemic legis legislative uh, frameworks around the refugees that creates uh, increasing levels of stress, I think. And uh, when I'm around in in Denmark talking to various professionals, you know, we we experienced uh, we experienced a lot of, you know, good intentions. People want to do their job in a good way. People want to uh, help refugees get a good start and stuff. But we see some frameworks that makes it increasingly difficult to do, um, in, imposing increasing levels of stress. And I, I think to reverse that trend would be uh, would be the most important thing. Hmm? Excellent. Thanks. Yes, Bern, go ahead. Yes, um, thank you very much, Mats. Uh, I was wondering, uh, you mentioned that uh, refugees are uh, are treated uh, in the same way uh, in terms of medical treatment. Mm. Um, but, but what about, the, I, I assume this is for refugees who uh, had asylum, granted mm. asylum. What about the those that are uh, seeking asylum? What are the possibilities to access, access health care for them? They have access to healthcare via facilities uh, in the centre, so via the operators that, you know, the Danish Red Cross, they run quite a few centres, for example, and there are health staff uh, available there. But if, 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 uh, if refugees need uh, further uh, special uh, medical treatment, uh, it, it, it goes via the immigration service that, um, that has to grant it. Yeah. So, <coughs> and that's of course also an issue in relation to. Um, oh. <laughs> that's of course also an issue in relation to, uh, for example, uh, PTSD treatment or whatever. But uh, but there's of course also some challenges in relation to engaging in extensive specialized treatment uh, for PTSD when people are still in the pre-asylum phase, right? With all the stress and turmoil that comes to that. So I think that we see a tendency that, that these interventions, that they are, uh, that they are um, uh, given 
uh, after people have gotten uh, have gotten uh, asylum. But we have an overall issue, which is a problem with the exchange of information between the pre-asylum system and the integration system, because there is, of course, some information regards as regards uh, the health conditions, but also other things, you know, competences and stuff like that, that uh, that the uh, asylum system should uh, deliver to the municipalities of the actors in charge of the integration in order to to ensure a good start, basically. And that connection is an ongoing challenge and has been for many years. Mm. Yes, thanks. Go ahead. <clears throat> thank you very much and thank you for taking up all the other things which are not like the therapy but what mm. people need to be to live normal life and to feel good mentally and so but one thing is that did you say in the beginning of your speech that you have some uh, lectures or advice or information for the volunteers or because I think uh, at least in Finland and Sweden I think it's the same in Denmark and other European countries that there are thousands and thousands of people who has uh, became as volunteers to help refugees. And one important thing is in this normal life of people is friendship. Yes. And it's important to get to school and to work, but friendship is mm. also very important. Yes, yes it is. Uh, and what we try to do is to, to ensure some sort of continuity in that effort uh, to, to ensure that there are networks uh, that can provide, you know, contact persons, contact families, whatever, for, for newly arrived refugees. But it's also important, in order to make these networks sustainable, we try to also offer the, uh, the, the volunteers some sort of, um, you know, training uh, and material to qualify their volunteer activities, including also material and training about how to be in a volunteer uh, relation with uh, refugees with trauma. So we have some, both some, you know, short trainings, but also some materials and leaflets uh, targeting specifically volunteers about trauma and PTSD. Hmm. Okay, thanks. And the last one. About the health monitoring that you said, I wanted to ask if the <coughs> health monitoring system for asylum seekers, for underage asylum seekers and the adults are the same or underage get more support for PTSD or mental health or general uh, health monitoring? Um, for, for asylum seekers or for refugees? Yeah, for the difference between underage asylum seekers and the adults. Yeah. Um, I, I, I wouldn't know in detail, but I know that underage uh, asylum seekers, they are placed in, uh, in asylum centers for underage, uh, for minors, right? Uh, where there are, uh, you know, additional staff uh, and, uh, and all, you know, additional support, support functions. But sort of overall, in terms of health service, the, 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 um, the, the you know, the rights or the access would be the same. But there are increased social support for the minors. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we are having this small pr uh, uh, um, present for you. Uh, these are two characters, Finnish characters, Tatu and Patu, and they are telling you about Finland. Perfect. Thank you. Thank, thank you for coming. Uh, Okei, okay, eli nyt pidetään pieni tauko. Uh, 